Hello. How are you guys doing today? Good morning to you. You live in a shoe. I'm on my way to get coffee and then run some errands. And then I'm gonna come back and I think I'm gonna make a couple videos and then get ready to go to my meeting. I've had a good day so far. It's really nice out. It's 59, but it feels even actually a little warmer than that. And um, it's beautiful outside. The leaves are starting to change a little bit here. Um, I finished this book that I had been reading for Spookathon, Small Spaces. I finished it this morning. After I did my prayers and meditation, I had like, um, like 30 pages left of it. It was like this elementary, middle grade school book, but some of the humor in there was, I don't know, they, some of the things they said were definitely more like, I don't know that you would get it as a kid, you know what I mean? Do you read books like that to your kids and like some of the humor is like more for adults than it is for kids? I need to trim my beard today too. It's like looking really full and kind of, yeah. So, um, what's shaking? Bacon? <laughs> So I did that, did my prayers, did my meditations. I did not do a face mask. I haven't actually done a face mask for a couple days. I, I, I can't remember the last time that I did it in the morning. I might do one later before I get ready to uh, go to the meeting. We'll see. Um, I just kind of wanted to be out, to be honest today, to go and like just run around. I think I'm gonna go to a couple Halloween stores and try to figure out a costume to wear for Friday evening when we go to Haunted Fest. Today. Can I get a venti iced coffee with two equal, please? Ice venti, two equal iced coffee. Anything else? Nope, that's it. Three forty-three. Thank you, Peter. She's so sweet to hear. She said, "Thank you, Peter." <laughs> they are so nice, the people that work here. I don't know if I have. She's like yelling out of the car window. I love happy people. Um, I need to reload my app. <laughs> Sometimes I like to touch nature. <laughs> oh my gosh. I woke up today a pound thinner and very hungry. And I actually, before I went to bed last night, I ate my pumpkin pie that Tanya bought for me like two days ago. And then Alex bought all of these sugar cookies and I had a sugar cookie. Um, that must be why I had such wonderful dream. <laughs> Do you think that's true? Like if you eat something like heavy and sour before you go to bed, you have nightmares. But if you eat something sweet before you go to bed, you have like nice dreams. Have you ever heard of that? I don't know if that's true or not. What are you guys doing today? Are you working? Are you running errands? Are you taking care of the kids? Are you cooking dinner? <laughs> are you putting your makeup on? Are you getting ready to watch some Netflix? I need to get back to watching the Netflix. I like, I watched the first two, uh, episodes of Making a Murderer that last night I was going to watch another episode when I got home and that just didn't happen. Um, but I listened to a lot of my audiobook last night um, for the book club. So, yeah. When is it supposed to start getting cold again? I feel like this, like, they're she's not waiting she's been sitting here i'm like i feel like she's not waiting for oh she is waiting for something i was like they just seem like they're hanging out talking not like i'm in any hurry because i'm not <laughs> i got nowhere to go
do this thing here. There's like a sign right here um, on Thanksgiving morning, and it's called the Drumstick Dash. Hi, Peter. How are you? Great. How are you? Good. It's good to see you. It's so nice I haven't seen you in a while in here. Yeah, I'm always like running around back there. I know you're just too you're too busy and too important. <laughs> right. See you later. See you later. <laughs> that was so funny. She was like. <laughs> This is a, I got a small straw, but that's okay. Bigger one. But anyway, they do this thing every Thanksgiving morning, and it's called the drums, uh, drumstick da, drum, drum, drum. I just said it. What was it that I said? <laughs> um, but anyway, it's like you can go walk it or run it. It's like a little marathon here that they do. We have so many friends that do it, and Alex and I always say that we're gonna do it one of these years, and we never do. Yeah, I need to trim my beard and shave up through here and stuff. I need to figure out, like, whenever I, like, am watching my vlog back and stuff, the line of my beard has gotten so bad. I used to, like, when I first had my beard, I think partly it's also because I used to keep my beard super short and, um, like, a lot shorter than this. Like, it almost looked like 5 o'clock shadow. And people would say, how do you keep the line so distinct on your jawline? Well, now, when I watch my vlogs and videos and stuff, it's not at all. I've got to do a better job of keeping that, like, that line. I don't know how I did it back then. I was no thinner then than I am now, so it doesn't have anything to do with that. Oh. It's like some of these leaves have started to change, but not all of them. Every time I see birds sitting up on the phone wires, I always think of that song. Do you guys know that song, Like a Bird on a Wire? And um, I think Bob Dylan sang it maybe originally. I don't know who sang it originally. But then the Neville Brothers did it. They did a remake of it um, for the movie. Did you ever see the movie with Mel Gibson and Goldie Hawn, Bird on a Wire? I loved that movie. Like a bird. On a wire. <laughs> okay, Peter, not time to sing right now. See, it's interesting because, like, you'll look. I don't know if you can see this if I turn it, but like a lot of the trees have not turned, and then all of a sudden you'll see like one bright red tree. Do you see that? But like in a week, like all the trees will be that color. It's beautiful. But then, like within a day or two, they all fall down. All the leaves are gone. They all fall down. I feel very peaceful today. I'm excited about going to my meeting tonight. I need to figure out what other day I want to pick up a meeting this week because I want to go to another noon meeting sometime this week. And, uh, yeah. I also want to make chili one night this week. I got to get the other um, crock pot. So we have a, like my mom's crock pot, which Alex just threw out because it was so old. But then I was in the basement and I was like, oh my God, I forgot that um, I have my aunt's crock pot because when they sold the condo, you know, Caroline was like, uh, my cousin, she was like, well, you can take whatever you want. She had, like, all this stuff sitting out. And I was like, you don't want the, this crock pot? It was a really nice crock pot. And my aunt, like, used it, you know, all these years. And I was like, I'll take the crock pot. And she was like, okay. Which is great, because now, like, we can make one crock pot of chili for Alex. I don't know why my terms are going. And one crock pot of chili for me that's vegetarian, you know? I gotta start learning to make stuff in the crock pot. So whenever we go to parties, like, where we have to, like, take, you know, like, a meal or whatever. Like, to take a cheese dip or something like that. Like, a nacho cheese dip. Like, Melissa always takes nacho cheese dip. And it, like, like it's gone within, like, 20 minutes. Like, people love nacho cheese dip. Like, she puts, like, some other stuff in it. She puts, like, peppers and stuff in it, you know. But, like, people love that at a party. I really wanted to go to 
to this Ruth's Cafe again and get a grilled cheese sandwich today, but I thought, you know, I think, I think I've gone there enough recently. I still have a half an hour if I want to, though. <laughs> they close at three. All the brunch places close at three. All right, well, listen, I'm gonna go and run some errands and listen to my uh, audio book for a little while. And I will be back later. Bye. Hello. <sighs> How are you guys doing tonight? I literally got so much stuff done in 30 minutes. I um, came home and <clears throat> I didn't get home until later than I thought I did, was going to get home from running errands and stuff. And uh, I was like, I really want to lay down for an hour. So I laid down, I had a great nap with the pups. I did not make any videos today, except for my vlog. I'll post my vlog every day I, until uh, I come back, you know. My plan is that as of November 1st, to be posting consistently on all the channels again. Is it a full moon tonight? You guys, look, this is so crazy. It's like right in front of me too. Look how beautiful this is. Do you see that? It's like full moon right there. Um, so I came home, I took a nap, and then I got up and at like 6.45 to get ready, feed the dogs, take a shower. I had the dogs food in the microwave and Alex came home. Um, he went and did some like Halloween costume shopping with his friend Sarah, his best friend. So he just got home and he looked, took the food out of the microwave and fed the dogs while I was blow drying my hair and throwing on my clothes. I just did, I just washed all of my clothes today and I literally, I have black jeans on, black t-shirt, I have my burgundy vans that I've been wearing all week long, black socks. I feel like everything I own is like, <laughs> Like, I have so many black t-shirts, long and short. And I trimmed up my beard. I tried to do it the way that I used to do it, which is where I hold a comb right here and shave underneath it so that the line would be straighter. I don't know how well I did, but... I feel like this side was easier than this side, but it's probably because I'm right-handed so I could hold the comb and then shave with the other hand. This side was harder to do, and I don't feel like I did as great a job, but whatever. My hair is still kind of wet right now. So I'm going to pick up Tanya Jean Appelstein and we're going to the meeting. And, um, yup. I'm excited tonight to go to the meeting. I had a couple of my friends text me and they're like, are you coming tonight? I was like, yeah. And then we might go get something to eat afterwards. I don't know, it depends. Sometimes she eats before the meeting and sometimes she hasn't and she's hungry after. So if she hasn't, then we might go get something to eat after the meeting. Um, what is rattling over there? I haven't, um, I haven't eaten anything today, um, and I'm not really even hungry. I had a sugar cookie earlier, actually, so I've had one sugar cookie today because Alex bought these sugar This is why I can't have things in the house, see, because then I start grazing. He actually has two different kinds of sugar cookies. One are, like, the really soft, they're both, like, Kroger brand, but one are, like, they look better, they're real soft, and they have like all this glittery sugar on it, and the other ones are just like harder sugar cookies, and the harder ones are actually better, even though they don't look as good. So yeah, that was my day, I had a very relaxing, calm day, I talked to my neighbor for a long time, she's having a party this weekend, and she had texted me, and she was like, I just want you to know that we're gonna have a live band, and people playing music, and I was like, okay. So I saw her, I was like, she's like, do you care? And I was like, no, I don't care. Oh, <laughs> uh, am I being perceived as the old person that cares if somebody has a party? I said, the party on, do what you gotta do. <laughs> I said, I don't care, I'll probably not even be here on Saturday night. So anyway, yeah, there was that, and what else happened today? Nothing, I don't think. It almost kind of felt more Halloween-y, like over the weekend, Halloween-y. Over the weekend when it was like, you know, rainy and windy and colder. Because that's kind of how I remember Halloween being when I grew up. Um, 
when I was talking about the costumes, it was so great, all the comments that I received, like, I can't remember who it was, I think they said they grew up in Alaska, one of you out there said you grew up in Alaska, and all of your costumes would ha always have to be something that could, like, fit over a winter coat, and you said something about Disney princesses, like, bulky Disney princesses or something, it was so funny, and, um, but, like, I remember Halloween being that cold when I was growing up. Like, really cold, you know? And, um, like, I think that's why I remember a couple years ago, it really stands out to me that my cousin and I, like, took the picture in the snow because we hadn't had that in forever. But when I was growing up, I remember, like, Halloween always was just very blustery. It typically always rained around Halloween, so... You know, the streets were wet, and it just was not fun weather. But I think, to some degree, that's kind of what made it fun, going trick-or-treating. Like, I don't remember going trick-or-treating and, like, it being, like, you know, short sleeves and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, I don't remember any of that. But it could have been, and I just don't remember it. I doubt it, though. This is, like, where, like, four lanes merge. Do you ever listen to a song so much that you can't get it out of your head? That's where I'm at right now with this Ed Sheeran song that's remixed by Robin Schultz. I've like listened to it so many times that I can't get it out of my head. And it's not like the whole song that's going through my head. It's like, like four words. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it just on repeat, on repeat, on repeat. I need to find another song. I've kind of, as corny as this sounds, I've kind of been wanting to listen to like, I, I bet somebody has a playlist of it on YouTube, so I just need to find it so I can play it like in the background while I'm doing stuff around the house. But I want to find like, um, you know like all the Halloween songs from back in the day, like I was saying the other day, like Monster Mash and Jeepers Creepers and all those songs. Like I want to find like a playlist. If anybody knows where there's like a YouTube playlist of that, let me know, but I'll, I can find it too. It's like, it is a full moon tonight. It's beautiful. Did you guys buy your mega million dollar ticket? Can you even imagine? heard of those like I have a book that I got of like I can't remember what it is but it's all about lottery winners and half of them are like good outcomes but the other half of them are like tragic outcomes and um, of like people that win like huge sums of money in a lottery but when you think about what is it up to 1.6 billion dollars at this point I mean seriously I mean, to me, you know, $20,000 is life-changing money. So I can't imagine $1.6 billion. I can tell you that if I won that money, there'd be a lot of happy people because there is a lot of, there's a lot of good that I would do with that money. And I'm not just saying that either. I, there's not a whole lot in the world that I want. I'm sure I could find a few things I wanted with $1.6 billion. But you know what I mean? Like, I'd travel. I'd have my condo redone, but I'd probably keep it, you know? I think first and foremost, you'd help out your family, right? I'd like to help out some strangers, so, you know, like, some of you, like, I, and I'm not just bullshitting either, like, I thought about this today, I was like, I think it would be cool to, like, random people that have been supportive from the very beginning, you know, like, that have never wavered. I don't think, like, when good things happen, it's not, they're not as fun and enjoyable unless you can share them with other people. Um, whatever that is, you know what I mean? It's like this one night I was at the casino and um, like these machines that we play, my friend Valerie and I, they usually get like high up and it's called like the grand that you can hit and it usually hits between like 12 and like 16,000, $17,000. Valerie has hit it twice, okay? <laughs> Cause she has good luck. I don't have good luck. But anyway, um, although the last time that I was there, I hit the major, which I had never done before, and it was like 500 and something, 520 or $30. I was so excited. It just like dropped. I had never hit it before. But anyway, 
and she's always very generous. Like when she wins, she always like, you know, she's like, oh here, like here's some money, you know. And there's this guy that like, he's so nice. I was sitting next to him one night and he was like winning a lot on this machine. He had this machine up to like $2,000. And um, like he would act, before he like went into this like bonus, he would say, like I apparently am good luck for other people, not necessarily always for myself, but for other people. And so he was like, uh, touch my, will you like rub my machine for me cause you're good luck. And I was like, okay. And he got laughing so hard. It was this older guy, he was so nice. So he like went down, he was like this, do you think this machine's getting cold? And I go, yeah, I think that machine's cold now, right? And he goes, okay, cause you, since you said it, I'm gonna move. And he went down to the end machine and he started playing this end machine and I mean, to tell you with like 10 spins in he hit the grand for sixteen thousand dollars so he had hit like a total of like eighteen thousand dollars he gave me a hundred bucks he was so nice and um and like all the people around him he gave like a hundred bucks and he tipped out the people that like paid him out you know and stuff like that he was just really nice and um my friend Valerie has just been awesome like that too. I, I wish I would win enough at the casino to give money to other people, but I never do. It'd be like, here's a dollar. <laughs> you wanna pick a piece of gum? I got a piece of gum and a dollar. <laughs> or if I win, I just like, well the one night I won, I won like, I walked out with like $900, that was nice. But that never, never, never happens. But I actually really, I can't remember how much, a 700 and something is what I really uh, like won after what I brought in too, but that's still good. I was still very happy about that. I haven't been for a while. Maybe I'll call Valerie up, see if she wants to go to the casino tonight. <laughs> oh my God, that song is just going on repeat in my head. It's driving me nuts. Tanya just called before I left. She was like, are you still coming to get me? And I was like, yeah, why? And she was like, well, I texted you about bringing the tickets and you uh, to, to Teresa Caputo. And she's like, you never responded. And I was like, oh yeah, I took a nap. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, I'm on my way. I told you I was coming. She's like, okay, I was just checking. I need something to drink. We usually give fountain pops after though. This meeting, it splits up into smaller groups, and so depending on the size of your group, or descending, depending on the topic or whatever, you could get out like in 15 minutes at like, at, well, I mean, it usually takes, we don't go into our small groups till about 8.15 or 8.20 after the meeting starts and we've gone through everything, but I mean, you could be out of the meeting by 8.30, or you could be out of the meeting at 10 after nine, it just depends on what group you're in. And I always usually, like we count off, but I usually sit in whatever group Tanya's in or she sits in whatever group I'm in because this is like one of the only meetings that we go to during the week so, together. So, um, we always seem to be in the group that, probably because we're all of us, a bunch of talkers. Um, we're usually in the group. What is that? Um... <laughs> It said, call Alex back. I was like, what is this? Oh, she's coming out right now. My coat in the back. What are you doing? Sorry to be late. Oh, Lord. I'm like, not even that late. I'm, I'm late because I had to run back in and get these tickets that you lost. Oh, my gosh. Did you see the moon, babe? Yeah, it's so pretty. I put it in my pocket. I think it's the science moon or... Oh, the hunter's moon. The hunter's moon. Okay, we're gonna go, so I'll see you guys later. See Bye. ya. Hello. I just dropped Tanya off. We went and got fountain pops. I was just like sitting here reading through some of my comments on my uh, Peter Mon channel. <clears throat> Somebody asked, so what happened to daily vlogs or will you delete my comment again? So my daily vlogs are on my daily vlog channel every day, daily vlogs, and I don't delete comments. <clears throat> oh, I had a great meeting tonight. You know what? Before I take off from Tanya's, let's do this. Hold on. <clears throat> 
Christy said, blue heart, blue heart times a thousand, dog and flower. Keep positive. Adventures and said, I adore these, these vlogs. They're getting um, enough through a very hard time and I feel not so lonely. I watch but rarely comment, but I'm here. Love to you, Peter, and your family. Best wishes. Um, and... Ray, Rain sa Raven said, I'm glad you're going to focus on taking care of yourself and taking one step at a time. Um, Dean's girl said, love you, Peter. And tons and tons of blue hearts. And Anna's Ransom Beauty said, Peter, this is my favorite channel out of all of your channels right now. So let's counteract because <laughs> I want to give the positive all the attention. So, and I feel very positive tonight. I had such a great meeting. Um, saw a bunch of my friends. It just was a really, my meeting topic that I was in, because we split up into like, you know, four different groups. It, what is that? Well, you're talking about uh, the four step inventory, but <clears throat> it just was like, my group that I sat in was, and it was interesting because we count off like one, two, three, four. Um, and Tanya and I like, are usually not the same number, but we said we're like where we want, basically, because we're not rule followers. So anyway, we but tonight we both were uh, number twos. So, um, but there were it's like a, it was like a mixed group, and there are people that I hadn't sat in groups with for a long time, so it was kind of fun to listen to what they had to say, and um, it was a really good meeting, and talked to a bunch of friends afterwards. We were talking about, it was interesting talking about like inventory and just like that whole process of, you know, like when you, like one of the things I do every day is uh, I pray for resentments to be removed um, because I think that I have to put action towards that, you know. <clears throat> no matter what somebody else is doing in the world, I think it's important for me to take a look at, like, my resentment. I mean, like, that, that comes from me, you know? And so, you know, resentments are a big part of inventory that you take a look at resentment. And often when you look at what your part is in that, you know, your part is in holding on to that resentment to some degree, you know? And, um, you know, for me... Like, this is kind of a recovery slogan, but resentments are unfulfilled expectations. Resentments are when I think somebody should have acted a certain way or something should have gone a certain way that it didn't end up going, you know, and I get resentful about that. And that can be a friend or a family member. You know, I think sometimes we get uh, deeper resentments towards people that we're closest to because we have an expectation that they should have acted or, you know, behaved in a certain way. And, um, and then we forget that people are human, you know, and that they have their own situation going on, you know? And it's like, I think it's very much putting yourself in their shoes and, you know, kind of understanding where they're coming from. So it was good for me, you know, cause we were talking about that tonight. We were talking about like patterns and like one of the best things that, um, for me on doing a four step, which is making a searching and fearless moral inventory of my life was that when I, um, when I do inventory in my life on things that are going on, whether it's, you know, ang like fear, anger, resentments, whatever I'm looking at in my life, <clears throat> let's say if I have s several different, you know, examples of that. Typically, what I find is that there's a pattern through that and I might not have any control over what's happening to me, but I do very much have control over how I respond to things, you know? Um, on whether I choose to engage, whether I choose to, who, who, you know, remain teachable, who I choose to be in that moment. And, um, and ultimately, you know, that's really not between me and that other person. It's really not between me and anybody else. Ultimately, that's between me and my higher power, you know, and how much do I choose to grow in that moment? Um... interesting, you know, like I did my first inventory when I was 23 years old. And so it's been 23 years since I did my first inventory. And, um, my husband's calling me. Hold on a second. Okay, I'm back. He was just 
just asking me a question. I just learned something about my camera. I learned why every time I touch my camera, it like goes in. It's because of this thing right here. Watch. I know it won't do it. It doesn't matter, but I don't actually want it to, to happen, but it like focuses in. Um, I was talking about inventory. I don't really remember what I was saying, but yeah, I mean like I've done inventory, you know, my entire sobriety and um, you know, it's always helpful to me. And the thing that I think is the greatest reward out of it is that I see like, you know, patterns in my behavior through that, you know, and the things I need to work on and character defects and things like that. And, um, and I think that's what's so powerful coming, you know, out of it. And I think also sitting there and listening to, you know, like men and women that have 40 plus years of sobriety talking about, well, last week when I was inventorying this or, you know, and it's like, okay, they're still doing these things just like I am, you know, that helped us in early sobriety. Like that's really powerful, you know? And <clears throat> I mean, ultimately, it's about being the best version of myself that I can be. So, I don't know, it was such a great meeting tonight. It was very peaceful. And, um, yeah. <laughs> There's like a police car up here that's pulled somebody over and this guy is literally crawling down the road now in front of me. Like, he's two lanes over. I texted my friend Valerie, and she's going to the casino later. So I think I'm going to maybe meet up with her later. But I also really want to um, get into my audiobook a little bit so I can listen to my audiobook on the way up there if I finish my vlog before then. Finish my vlog and then go home and upload it and spend some time with Alex. I mean, it's early. It's 10 o'clock right now and he's just working on some stuff right now. So he said he's got like an hour of work to do. And then, um, so I'll vlog and get home about then and then hang out with him for a while. And I saw a friend of mine tonight. She never comes to this meeting. Like maybe like twice a year she comes and she was there. It was so good seeing her and uh, we got laughing so hard at the beginning of the meeting. We were like talking and stuff. And Whenever I have to pick up Tanya, she's always like, we're running late. And we always get there with like five, ten minutes before the meeting. I'm like, we're totally fine. And we go in and um, had a cup of coffee. It was fantastic. <laughs> I love meeting coffee. The meeting that this, my home group meeting is really like interesting right now because it's a really good mix of like people that are like within their first year of sobriety, people that have like 20 to 40 years, and then like people that have, let's say three to 10 years. And it's like really spaced out evenly. So depending on like whatever the topic is, you get a lot of different points of view, you know? And the reality is that when I first got sober, it was a, like, you know, I, like I was talking tonight about, I was really resistant when I first got sober to doing anything that I was told, you know? But I finally got to the point where I just wanted to live, so I was willing to do what anybody told me to do, you know? Um, but I was really scared, like, at first. Like, the, you know, I, it wasn't my first introduction to the program, but at the same time, it was like, it was terrifying to me, you know? And, um, and you know, in reading, like, the basic texts and some of the other, you know, approved literature, it was like, it all seemed very overwhelming to me. Like, the language I didn't understand, it seemed very old-timey to me, and, um, It's so weird to me, like, when I think back, you know, um, I mean, I've now been sober for 23 years and 10 months and six days, something like that. I actually have an app on my phone that tells me exactly how many, like, hours and days I've been sober. I'll pull over and tell you guys in a second. We were talking about that in the, um, in the meeting tonight. Somebody
somebody else brought it up, like, that they had looked at it recently and how many hours they had, and that was like, uh, it's a friend of my sponsors, and he said something like 13,000 days, so I know I, I can't have that much because he's got a lot more time than I do, um, but, you know, like, if you had told me, like, I mean, I remember that first month so vividly, kind of, you know, like, I don't, not everything, but certain things, you know, I, I remember the day I got out of treatment, like, so vividly, and, um, you know, we did, uh, there was somebody that was a newcomer to the meeting tonight. I mean, this was like their very first meeting ever. And that's so powerful to sit in a meeting with somebody the very first time they ever come in, you know, especially if it's somebody that stays and you get to see their duration and, um, their journey. I don't know. It's just like you get to be part of something that's bigger than you, you know? And so we did a third step prayer with them, which is basically where we all just, you know, say this prayer and, um, and a lot of people have different ideas of what the prayer means, but it's basically a prayer of surrender. And so, um, the third step is made a decision to turn my life and my will over the care of God as I understood him. And so basically what you're saying when you do the third step prayer is I, I'm like ready to do what I need to do to stay sober and have this life and turn my life and my will over. And so, um, but, you know, like, I remember the first day I got out of treatment, my friend picked me up, and um, we went and got my hair cut, and then I went and I was going back to school, so I went and got my books for school and stuff like that, and then she kept me busy, like, the whole day, and we came back to my apartment, and I remember, like, my dad had had the place, like, professionally clean, and he had had, like, you know, um, like food in the refrigerator and I got very upset talking about this one night because you know like just thinking about my what my dad went through you know like I remember he got me like a new coffee maker and all this kind of stuff and you know, all this like you know fresh like juices and all this stuff you know for me and like a new comforter for my bed and and I, I remember I came in and he had come there first. And so like he had like all the lights turned on and it was just like very homey setting. And he had bought me like all these recovery movies on videotape and um, like clean and sober and um, some other recovery movies. And I remember I came in and um, like I wasn't committed to staying sober and I wasn't committed to staying sober for many months. Um, like I did what I was told at some point, but I wasn't sure that I was in it for the long haul until about six months sober. I think it was about six months when I got my six month token and I walked out of a meeting and I was like, I have never done anything in my life for six months consistently ever, except for drink and use drugs. But anyway, um, I remember when my friend left that day and she's like, are you going to be okay? Do you need me to stay? And I was like, no, I'll be fine. And, um, I sat on the edge of my bed and I like, like my duffel bag was like underneath like my feet and from treatment and I sat there and I thought to myself, I can run, and my counselor at the time, who's still a friend of mine today, she had said, um, if you do this, this will be the hardest thing that you've ever done in your entire life, but it'll be worth it. And I remember her saying that to me, or I, in that moment, like I remember her saying that to me and I thought to myself, because I had talked to my old roommate that I was really good friends with about, like, <sighs> moving to California and just disappearing and nobody would ever see me again, you know, with her. And I don't know what the hell I thought I was going to do in California, but I don't know. It seemed like some kind of fantasy. And I sat there and I thought to myself, I can run or I can stay. Like, I can see myself, like, right now, like, getting up and... And I used to drink in the shower. I loved to drink in the shower. That was like one of my favorite things to do. And um, I remember turning on the shower. Like I would get up during the day and I would like smoke a joint. And then I would take like two Vicodin. And I would like take a bottle, like a beer or like a 40 or like, you know, just a bottle to the shower and take a shower and just sit there and let the water just go all over me. That's literally how I started my day. And, um... Sometimes I would drink, if I was real sick in the morning, because I had, like, DTs bad, if you know what those are, they're, like, delirium, trim, and like, shake, um, and it's basically your body going to, in to withdrawals to some degree, um, so I would mix, like, half vodka and half <laughs> Pepto-Bismol, 
and um, drank that. But anyway, so the last time, you know, 30 some days prior to this that I had been in that shower was the night that I got ready to go out with my friends on the day that I was like the last day that I used. And like, so I'm sitting there thinking about that and I go and I turn on the shower and you know, my dad had like towels, like, you know, all folded nicely for me and everything. And you know, all new bath products in there and I remember standing underneath the water. I'm like, I was not a God-centered person at that time. You know, like, I, I always believed in something, but I just didn't know, like, what was out there. And, um, I remember I just stood underneath that water and I was like, and I said it out loud. I was like, God, I can't do this on my own. I need your help. And, um, later, in the very same meeting, I, I had to do a third step prayer, you know, on my knees with my sponsor, but um, I always look at that as my third step that I did, like basically, you know, turning my life over to God because I was like, I can't do this and, I, you know, I don't want to die. I was very scared that I was going to die. Um, Like, I put on pajamas and <laughs> sat down on the couch and smoked a cigarette. And, um, that was it, you know? Something passed over me, I don't know. And I think after that first day, honestly, like, every day, you know, but I remember bits and pieces of days where I can see myself pacing in my apartment because I wanted to use so bad or calling people, calling people. I had like literally like a number of like phone, I had like, like all these phone numbers on scrap paper that people had given me at meetings tonight and um, not tonight, I was thinking I gave somebody my number tonight, but the people give me, you know, their numbers on, you know, scrapbook, scrap pieces of paper, or backs of checkbooks and stuff like that, you know business cards and I had all these numbers but then I also had these dealers numbers and I was just saying and I lived like a block from the liquor store and I was like okay if I can just make it till you know like such and such time that I can go like drink you know and I would call and I would call and I would call and and that's really how I got through cravings you know and then like eventually somebody would you know pick up and they'd say you know do you need me to come get you or I had so many people that kept me busy my first six months, so many people, I can't tell you, I mean, I slept on so many couches my first six months sober because I would just be like, you know, rattled. I got in this relationship right when I got sober, which was the stupidest thing to ever do. You know, they tell you don't get in a relationship for your first year of sobriety. Well, I wouldn't have any of that. I knew what was best for me. <laughs> Stupid, don't do it if you're trying to get sober. And, um, you know, when that relationship started falling apart, I was a mess, you know, when I was ready to use. It doesn't matter though. You know, I mean, I'm like in my head thinking about how that all went down. And then I was answering myself. So what happened was, I was dating this guy, and at that time, he defined himself as bisexual. He doesn't today. Um, but I thought I had caught him cheating with a woman. And I was like, and my response to that was, what is wrong with me? You know, like what is wrong with me that I'm like, I'm sober. Like I've now cleaned up my shit and he still, he doesn't want me. <laughs> like what is, you know what I mean? Like that's, what's wrong with me? 
Well, there was a lot wrong with me, but that didn't have anything to do with why he was doing that. I don't even know to this day. He denied it forever and ever and ever. Um, but I don't, that didn't have anything to do ultimately with why we broke up. But, um, and he denied it. He was like, it never happened. I don't know what you're talking about. So I don't know. It may not have happened, but, but I was, you know, like I wasn't in a healthy place to be in any, any kind of relationship where I was handling anything like that, you know? And, um, that's why I said it doesn't matter because it's like it just doesn't matter like I look back on that and it's like you had no business being in a relationship to begin with you know what I mean I would like so he lived in another city he lived in Champaign Illinois at the time and I would go to a meeting at like 7 o'clock on like a Wednesday and then like in the winter because I dated him like in the like January February and I would then like drive straight from that meeting to Illinois, which it was like an hour and a half drive, in blizzard conditions, snowstorm conditions, okay, just to see him. And I can remember, like, I just talked about this on here not too long ago, you know, like, I get into his apartment and we, like, um, go get pizza. And it was a fun time, you know. something the other day and it's really weird and I'm like I like is this me getting older or whatever because you know like I always have such clear memory of things and I honestly couldn't like remember how something went down and I was like um god am I start is that a snowman oh no it's like what is that guy's name the big doe doe man guy do you know who I'm talking about <laughs> but I couldn't remember honestly like how it had gone down and I thought like am I losing my memory like Oh, God, you know? And then, like, the next day, something happened, and I remembered it, and I was like, oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's scary. And then, I got out of a relationship with him, and I was in this film studies class, and that's when I met my boyfriend, Todd, who, if you've watched my vlogs for a while, I found out had died a couple years ago. I found out from his Facebook page. It breaks my heart. And, um... I dated him for a couple months. And then my sponsor was like, are you ready to do it my way? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? He's like, like, no more boyfriends for the rest of the year. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm ready to do it your way. And I didn't. So, I mean, I, I didn't date until he approved for me to date somebody and then like I met this guy and um that was probably well it's Halloween so it was like six weeks before my year and um I remember I met him and through his brother and my I called my sponsor I was like I met somebody and he was like well it hasn't been a year yet and I was like I know but I really like him blah 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 he's like okay well here are my you gotta take it slow and you gotta let me know what's going on things and I was like okay and he was like will you do that I was like yes I still had no business being in a relationship you know I had so much shit I needed to work on Stick so much, the sugar, so nice. I went to so many meetings my first couple years. I was literally, I, I can't even tell you how many meetings I went to. I used to keep a calendar in my kitchen, like a hanging calendar, you know, of how many days I had sober. Oh, I was going to look on that thing, wasn't I? Of how many days I had sober and I would write down on the calendar like what meeting I went to. I think I saved that calendar. I think I actually have it in my basement. And I did that for two years. I would write down like every meeting I went to. Because <clears throat> I tried so many different meetings in Indianapolis at the time. Because I had a good friend of mine that got sober on New Year's Eve. I'm sure I've talked about that before. Or New Year's Day is her sobriety birthday. But we went to a lot of meetings together. 
I still don't like to go to meetings by myself. Like, I mean, if it's a meeting that like I go to regularly, I don't have a problem. But if it's like a new meeting, I don't like to go to it. But I mean, my social anxiety exists within the walls of sobriety as well, you know? So it's hard for me because like, where am I at? It's hard for me because, you know, I'll be like, like I was looking at this guy tonight that was in our group and <clears throat> He's like Alex's age and I've known him for a couple years and he goes to like every week he goes to different meetings. Like he has his home group, but like every week he tries different meetings. And he's been coming to this meeting for the last couple weeks. And I was like, you know, God, I wish I was like that. Like I could, you know, try all these different meetings. My sponsor's always like, well, let's just come pick me up and we'll go to try some different meetings. And um I need to do that. degrees outside it was like what was it 60 something earlier today and now it's 45 it's chilly outside tonight I remember going to uh, this one meeting I used to go to on Sunday nights <laughs> I think I've told this story on here before I used to go to it on Sunday nights and um, it was in a different program than I'm in now when I first got sober I went to I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and Cocaine Anonymous. I went to all three uh, programs. And, and now there's like Heroin Anonymous, or I think Cannabis Anonymous, or it's Marijuana Anonymous, I don't know. Um, that's not, like there's not really, I don't think meetings around here for that. There's, uh, but the Heroin Anonymous is huge in Indianapolis. Um, but anyway, I used to go to all kinds of meetings when I first got sober, so anyway, but I used to go to this meeting on Sunday night, and it was like uh, it was like an hour and a half, and like the first half an hour was like a speaker meeting, like they would have somebody tell their story, and then the last hour was like a discussion. They would go around and have a discussion, and it was like seven thirty to nine, and there was like this group of like I could see myself standing there because it was at a treatment program, not the one that I went through, but it was a different treatment program, and they would all stand outside, and everybody would smoke, you know, after the meeting, and it's like freezing outside and snowing and I can see myself standing there in this green coat that I had back in the day and I would just be like standing by myself smoking a cigarette and all these people would be like in a circle talking and they were all like there was like these were like the only young people that I saw consistently and this was because I think partly because it was a different program that I went to in my program there was only like those two other people that I was talking about the other night but in but so anyway I they all hung out together it was like this group and um like, they would sit there and, I, and they'd be like, oh, do you guys want to go get a cheeseburger? Yeah, well, let's go to Steak and Shake or something like that. You know, I just sit there and listen. I get so pissed. And I remember saying to my sponsor, I was like, they don't ever ask me if I want to go get a cheeseburger. And he's like, do you ever go over and introduce yourself to them and, you know, ask them if you can go with them? And I, and I just thought to myself, now you have to understand, this is like a month to two months sober, right? And I just thought to myself, that is so pathetic. I would never be like, hey, can I come with you to go get a cheeseburger? <laughs> Which I ended up doing to people all the time because down the road, because I just wanted people to hang out with, you know? But like, I had such horrible social anxiety to go up and talk to anybody. It was like so hard for me, you know? Especially sober, are you kidding me? Psh, I wasn't doing that. Um, but then when I made kind of a commitment to just one program and I started seeing people consistently at the same meetings and I didn't have any money because I like wasn't working and you know like my dad was giving me not a cash. I guess it was at 24 minutes because it just stopped. Uh, but my father wasn't giving me any cash you know. I mean he was being generous enough buying me food and a carton of cigarettes a week. But um. And I didn't have a car, so I had to ask everybody for rides places and stuff, you know? And, um... I mean, these people, I don't even know where they are today, you know? And, um... They buy me meals, you know? Like, this is what I was talking about the other night, like cheeseburgers and stuff. And, and you think that that... It, it sounds like it's not much, right? Until you're like... In that situation, and you're like, you don't have five dollars to your name, right? And somebody's sitting there and they're willing to buy you a ten dollar meal, and you're thinking to yourself, I don't deserve this. And somebody sees something in you that you don't even see in yourself, you know? 
And then you get to sit across from that person down the road and buy them a cheeseburger and see them sheepishly look down at it. You know, like, what did I do to deserve this kindness? And then the true gift is when you get to see them buy somebody else's cheeseburger for them, right? And they get it, see? And it's not just a fucking cheeseburger anymore. It's an act of kindness.
absolutely worth it because everything I have in my life is as a result of my sobriety, everything. I wouldn't have my relationship. I wouldn't have had, you know, my career. I wouldn't have had my relationships with my family. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have anything. If I didn't have my relationship with my husband, I wouldn't have my dogs, you know? I wouldn't have written a book. I don't know what my life would look like right now. Everything that I've had is a result of that. commented, I wasn't going to mention this, but I'm going to, you know, somebody commented on my, um, other channel today, you're a poor role model for people in recovery. When people ask me what comments bother me, that's a comment that kind of cuts deep, honestly, and I thought to myself, you know... share my story because I'm trying to be a role model. I share my story so hopefully somebody out there that's struggling is not as scared as they were before they watched me tell about my story and maybe it motivates them to go I can do it. If he can do it, I can do it. And if I've even helped just one person out there just one if I've helped just one person make it a little bit easier in their life or trying to get help or whatever out of two years of five channels, I'm totally fine with that. But I also don't stay sober for that reason. I stay sober because, you know, I have to have my sobriety. If I don't have my sobriety, I don't have anything, you know? I don't want to turn my heat on because it gets so hot in here so quick, but I can like, do you ever like drive around and you can like feel it on your legs, you know? I always get very introspective about my sobriety, like uh, the month or two leading up to my sobriety birthday, because it just, I remember so much of like what it was like. I mean, it was desperate. Like from now until, you know, December 17th when I got sober, it was desperate. It was ugly. It was scary. Um, I, I probably shouldn't have made it out. You know, I have weeks that I don't remember, let alone days. Um, I woke up places I had no idea how I got there, you know? Um, I would walk out into my apartment and somebody would be sleeping on my couch and I'd think, well, I don't even remember being with this person, you know? I put myself in some dangerous, violent situations. Um, especially towards the end when, you know, I was using harsher things and I think back on that, I think, I mean, my life is so removed from that today, you know, it's like, God, it's so scary. And I think that's like why, like the whole cheeseburger analogy, you know, it's like, because I can remember those nights. I can remember sitting at Perkins and getting like a Frisco melt at Perkins, you know, with like fries and sitting there and you know, and um, being like, this is so weird. Like, two months ago, my life, I was like chasing drugs and shit, you know, and trying to, it's just. When you've like lived that for so long, like the chase and the using and the not 
not letting anybody really know what's going on in your life because you got two worlds going on and all that kind of stuff. To then have a very simple life where everybody knows what's going on and everybody in your family and your friends and everybody, they know the score. And then to like just be sitting there eating a cheeseburger and Perkins, like that's hard. Like I don't know how to explain that to anybody if you haven't been through it, but that's hard I think, you know? And um, But I'm grateful for it. God, that feeling I would have. And I get that now still. Like, I think that's why on, you know, like Tuesday nights typically, because it's my home group, like I talk a lot about recovery on here on Tuesday nights when we go to meetings because, um, see now it's too hot in here. But like that feeling that I would have when I left a meeting um, was on a spiritual level. I can't even explain it. You know, I just would feel so renewed of mind and spirit, you know, I was literally happy, joyous, and free is how I felt, and, um, I don't know that I even knew that that was possible, like, I can remember, like, probably two years before I got sober, up to when I got sober, I can, like, literally remember thinking to myself, what the fuck are you gonna do? Like, what are you gonna do? Like, it is a matter of time before the gig is up with your dad and, like, he is done with you and he kicks you out. And, you know, I mean, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I honestly didn't. And I can remember being so terrified and thinking, like, I don't know, and I think that's why treatment was so important to me because I, and that wasn't my first treatment, you know, but that treatment combined with the consequences I was gonna suffer, one of which was gonna be homelessness, you know, with the doctor also looking at me going, you're very, very sick. With my neighbor, that was my detox nurse looking at me saying, you're very, very sick, you know. Um, at 22 and a half years old, penniless, having no clue what the hell I was gonna do to support myself. <laughs> Literally just, okay, you're, you're done with treatment, walk outside, and then you're on your own. I had no idea, like I had no clue. I was terrified, you know? And, um, So, you know, when it's like, you know, I'd go to two meetings a day. I'd sit at like this clubhouse all day long and the guy that like cooked in the kitchen knew I didn't have any money and he'd give me free food and stuff like that, you know, and, um, you know, I'd go to a couple meetings a day or two meetings a day, you know, and then I, I get excited to go to a meeting at night, you know, and hang out with a couple people that I had, you know, very few. I didn't have a lot of friends in early sobriety because, like I, I said, I wouldn't talk to people, you know? And, um... I think that's why, like, I think that... I, I think one of the reasons why Tanya and I have been friends for so long also has a lot to do with timing. Like, I think that, um... Had she and I gotten, like, become friends, like, let's say five or ten years down the road, I think it would have been the same, but I think we grew at such a same rate, you know, um, that she's, like, a year and two months behind me in sobriety, and so we really were at the same point of, you know, sobriety, and so service work we were doing together, and, you know, going to meetings, and meeting the same people, and, um, hanging out with the same people, and, I mean, after meetings, we'd sit there and talk about, you know, we talk steps and we talk recovery and we talk service work, you know, for hours and we around a bonfire and going out to dinner and stuff, you know, it was just, I like lived recovery. And I think it was so important that I was just absolutely saturated by it by the time that I met her. And, um, and that wasn't easy. I wasn't used to that, you know, and I met this whole group of people that that's what they were all about. And it completely changed my perspective on everything, you know? And I think had I not met her when I did, 
because it really helped me build a foundation for my sobriety. I mean, I had a pretty good foundation my first year going in anyway, because I, you know, was lucky enough to have a good sponsor and stuff like that. Well, my second sponsor, but, um, but after that, you know, it was like, I'm just so thankful for the people that I've met, you know? You know, I was thinking about, we were sitting in that meeting tonight, that like, I was talking about that comedian, I think it was yesterday or the day before, on my vlog, that said, if you're in a room with 100 people and 99 of them don't like you, but one does, that one person can change everything. And you know, I was looking around that room tonight and I thought to myself, at any given time over the last 23 years, you know, like, <laughs> how many of these people would just like, talking to me for five minutes after a meeting have completely changed my perspective on my life or a share that they, you know, shared in a meeting or a phone call where they, you know, helped me or that I helped them, they allowed me to help them or, you know, anything. It's just like, and then you think about the power of just one person with the, you know, one person to one person and it's so true. It's like one person can literally change everything, you know? Like, have you ever been thinking about, like, have you ever so, like, been convinced of something and then one person says something to you and it's typically very simple what they say, right? But what they say changes your perspective about everything, like, on how you look at it. You know what I mean? Like, have you ever done that before? Like, where you look at something and you're like, oh my God, like, I had never thought of it that way before, you know? I have no idea how long I've been vlogging. Okay, so 24 minutes, because it stops at 24 minutes, and then now it's been like 18 minutes. So what is that? I got my glasses on, I can't do math. 24, okay, that's 34. And six is 42 minutes now. 42 minutes I've been vlogging, and then whatever else I did before I got in this car. So probably in about an hour or something right now. You guys are probably like, we are so tired of these old school recovery stories, but I like kind of reliving it for me, you know? It's like, I think it's why I enjoy reading, you know, recovery memoirs and um, all that kind of stuff because it's like, I don't know, like it takes me back and reminds me of where I came from, you know? I think like the biggest thing with having long-term sobriety sometimes is you take for granted how hard it really was at the beginning. You kind of forget sometimes, you know? And so, you know, when a newcomer comes in and it's like, you know, like tonight, like this guy bringing up doing the, you know, four step, it's like, it's really powerful because then you can go back and you can kind of relive what that was like a little bit and remind yourself, you know? And it's good, I think, to remember where you came from. And um, I think it keeps you humble, you know? It's like last night when I was talking, okay. I was sitting here and I was talking and I just was saying some personal things about my sponsor that I probably should have. Okay, so last night when I was talking to my sponsor on the phone, you know, she was like, she was like, we were talking about all the stuff that's happened in like the last six weeks. And she's like, what do you think is the number one gift that you've been given out of all of this? If, you, if this is a, you know, like you're remaining teachable, this is a learning experience, what's the number one thing? And I said that I have received a lot of humility through this, you know, that I've been humbled. And I said, and people even said like, you know, he needs to be humbled. And, and maybe that is the lesson that I've learned through all of this, you know? Um, I don't know. At the time, it didn't feel like I was getting too big for my britches, but maybe I was, you know? Maybe it took all this to happen for me. I've been humbled, <laughs> truly. Um, you know, like... But I've never in my life 
gone through situations where I've been humbled where that's a bad thing, if that makes sense. Like, it's important for me to remember my shit's no different, you know? I mean, my, it's important for me to remember that my shit stinks just like everybody else's. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I don't know, maybe I was, you know, getting to a point where I didn't see it. I really didn't, honestly, you know? But that doesn't mean that it wasn't there. Um, but it's been a good reminder where I came from. You know, it's made me really value each and every subscriber that I have. And it's made me really value, like, those of you out there that consistently watch my videos and say positive things, what you know, or constructive things, like, it's really made me value that. <clears throat> I mean, I, I talk to friends of mine, you know, well, I have talked to friends of mine in the past that, you know, it, that YouTube to some degree, may seem like a machine to people, but like it never seemed like that, like when I was talking to them, like with either one of us, like we were just really in it because we love to do it, you know, like really at the end of the day, that's what it was about, you know? Um, so I don't know. principles to every aspect of my life, you know, and, uh, and I have to look at situations and say, what have I learned? Um, what am I being taught in this situation, you know? Because I think there's value in everything that we go through in our lives. Even the shit that hurts, I think there's a lot of value, you know? But I, I think the other thing that I've really learned too is how close serenity and peace of mind is. And it's always my choice on whether or not I have it in my life. You know, when I started doing the daily meditations and the prayers and the affirmations in the morning and it like, I can't snap with this finger very well. When it's like, <laughs> changed my life around like that, you know, just that 10 to 20 minutes of, you know, doing that and then a face mask and I felt like so motivated and inspired in the morning, you know, from that small act, what it made me realize was serenity is literally at my fingertips, literally. It's my choice on whether or not I have it in my life, you know. And I hope in my talking about that, that that's maybe something that at least one person out there has learned as well, is that, you know, it's a choice. And, um... You know, it's like every day that I get up, like I said, I'm not a quitter, you know, every day that I get up, when I look back on my life, okay, and where I was, and that I was literally sleeping in a bed with that was soaking wet with Jack Daniels and turned over ashtrays, trying to get my next fix. And I think at where my life is now, every day that I get up, I got a chance. Every day that I wake up, I have a chance. And I gotta remember that. I got more of a chance today. I, I, my life is a blessing, you know? said, expect a uh, magazine video <laughs> real soon. <laughs> Whenever I do a magazine video, like the old school OG Wolf Pack, you guys out there, you're always like, oh, I love the magazine videos. And the people that are like new, they're like, I hate the magazine videos. Why are you doing these? <laughs> like, 
It's like the same with the rants. I have gotten so many requests for rants lately. I don't know, maybe my, I'm just too peaceful or something because I've gotten so many requests for rants. I'm like, what should I rant about? Well, I could rant about pumpkin spice, but I think I did that last year. I don't really want to rant about pumpkin spice because I love pumpkin spice this year, everything about it. So I don't really know what to rant about. Um, construction in Indianapolis because it's driving me crazy, but that's a real rant. Um, the census worker never followed up. I don't know. Worrisome Warren must have been scared to contact me, although, like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh well, I'll find something to rant about. <laughs> You can't make it too serious, because if you do, then people are confused, and then they think that you're just, you know, the nastiest human being on the face of the earth because you're ranting about a census worker. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Some of the commentary I get, you guys, would make, you, if I told you, you'd be like, are you kidding me? Seriously. <laughs> That's why you have to take it all with a grain of salt. <laughs> I've never had Papa Murphy's pizza, and I think I've talked about it on here about four or five times. My cousin Caroline gets it all the time. Is it good? I think maybe I have had it at Caroline's house, but like I haven't ordered it myself. Have you guys had Papa Murphy's pizza before? Do you know what it is? Where you go pick it up and then you put it in the oven? That makes no sense to me whatsoever. They're like, it's so good. Why would you not just order a pizza that's being delivered to your house? Which sounds so good and so delicious to me right now. <laughs> I don't understand that. Why you wouldn't just order a pizza and go pick it up or have it delivered to your house. Why would you order a pizza that you had to cook? <laughs> what? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense to me. There's my rant video right there. Papa Mur Murphy's Pizza. <laughs> or how about if you go to Papa John's, you have to pay for all these extra sauces. I'm like, seriously? Okay, there would be no Papa John's without the sauces. Let's just be for real. I'm actually, I think I'm gonna make a pizza rant. I think that's what my video is gonna be. You guys are getting the exclusive on the pizza rant. That's what I'm gonna do. Oh my God, I almost told something, but I think I'll share it. I think I am going to do a pizza rant. Okay, you guys, listen. <laughs> I'm going to get off here and um, go home. And I can't believe it's 10.51, so I've been vlogging for almost an hour. And then, then whatever I had before. Go hang out with my husband. And then if Valerie texts me, I'm going to go meet her at the casino. And I love you guys. I hope you are having a wonderful Wednesday. And I will see you tomorrow. Bye.